Hey everyone, Joshua Gibson here, and you're listening to episode 37 of The Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. Before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to the show's newest sponsor, Bar Shield. Bar Shield is a maintenance kit designed to prevent rust and restore spin to a barbell's sleeves. The kit comes with a nylon brush, an 8 ounce bottle of anti rust, anti wear lubricant, and three microfiber towels. It also comes with a simple set of instructions which will have you well on your way to perfectly spinning beautiful bars. My discount code, PWPODCAST, will get you 10% off your entire purchase. It will also help me to continue producing great podcasts with amazing guests. Head over to BarShieldUSA.com and pick up a kit to get your bars spinning and looking like new. That's it for the intro. Now let's get to the interview with Dave Spitz, Wes Kitts, and Seb Ostrovich. And we are live. Today I'm joined by three special guests. We have California Strength's own Dave Spitz and Wes Kitts. Uh, we also have Seb Ostrovich from the Weightlifting House podcast, who is becoming a bigger and hey. bigger name in weightlifting. He's going to co-host this episode. So how are we doing, guys? Oh, man, we're great. I feel, quite frankly, mortified that you you lapped me in the same trio as uh, as Dave and Wes. I don't feel like I'm I'm quite a special guest in the same way that those two are, but... I appreciate the accolades, so I feel like they are slightly unjustified. Uh, I, I think I think you are probably uh, quickly rising above uh, anything that Wes and I are doing for the sport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe one day, not yet, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best to catch up. Yeah, so I wanted to say, talk- uh, go ahead, Dave. And so, what are we going to talk about today? Well, I wanted to say congrats on the recent win at the Pan American Championships. Uh, for those unaware, Wes. Took gold in the 105 class with a 172 snatch and a 212 clean and jerk. So the 181 was close. What was the reasoning behind that attempt? Oh, we're jumping right into it. <laughs> uh, uh, I just wanted to piss off the uh, internet community uh, that is lifting and see, see what, whose feathers I could ruffle with that jump. Yeah, you did a good job with that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, we had it because I was with Josh at the time when it was happening. Uh, well, at least I was at the same training camp as Josh was, and I was watching it with a few people. And actually, we commented that we we just loved the fact that you actually went for it. You know, it's like everyone talks about 175 or 176 because that's kind of where the new standard is. And so it was almost as though no one could imagine that you would make such a big jump. It's like you need to be doing these mid to high 70s just to continue ticking over. But you guys kind of said screw it like we're above that we've done 180 in training the goal is 200 because that's where the world record is so there's no time to mess about with 76 and 77 yeah i think that is um a big part of our decision making process i'll tell you like we don't approach these meets uh with a cavalier attitude though you know everything that we do from a training standpoint especially in that last mesocycle leading up to the taper you know it's very scripted in terms of the attempts that we're anticipating uh that we're going to make and then we have you know a kilo or two that we leave in terms of wiggle room to be tactical uh once you get into the meat but for Wes his scripted attempts leading up to that last mesocycle on the snatch were 165 opener 173 second 183rd uh you know and and you know, we condition these guys to make big attempts, uh, big big jumps between attempts. It's one of the it's one of the things that I think is important when working with later stage athletes. You know, Wes hasn't been to youth worlds and junior worlds, and you know he hasn't he hasn't had as much meat experience. You know, over a decade of lifting as a lot of the people that are at his level right now. So we always think that it's important to be able to open somewhere in the ninety. 92 to 93 percent range in the snatch mm-hmm. uh to make sure that we can work into the meat i think that's 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 something that we should all look to kind of uh maybe adopt if you're not if you're not growing up you know with a with a lifetime of of lifting experience you know 92 93 percent you can get to a pr from there mm-hmm. yeah so that's the first thing is we we those those attempts were scripted the second thing is we know who was at that competition from 2016 Pan Ams to 2017 Pan Ams to 2017 Worlds 
to now 2018 Pan Ams. We know Arroyo, we know Column B, we know Gonzalez uh, Barrios very well. These these athletes are not are not new to us, and we know their capabilities. And so <clears throat> that's the second thing. The third thing would be we had two bomb outs in the, in 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 the comp already. So you know, two two you know Derek's obviously was no fault of his. But you know he 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 wasn't able to total, and that was valuable points. And then mm-hmm. you know, Ethan, uh, unfortunately, not being able to make a jerk, that was valuable yeah. points. And for anybody who understands the sport, we're working to accumulate points for yeah. the United States team to send a delegation to the Pan Am Games, which is a meet that that will count for us. Uh, for accumulating points to get to ultimately the Olympic Games, so it's a very important endeavor. And so helping out West and helping out Team USA is, you know, the third factor. And so the difference between silver and gold in the snatch is a three-point differential. Mm-hmm. So, so it made sense to try and help Team USA with uh, with a gold medal attempt in the snatch. Um, so. You know, you juxtapose all that against the idea, like you originally brought up, that fuck 175, fuck 176. We are training for the world championships and ultimately the Olympic Games, and he's got to move into that 400 kilo total range. And the only way we can do that is just to to get into the 80s and snatch. So he had to feel that in his hands. Mm-hmm. Um, so as the comp broke down, we opened at 165. 172 represented an, an attempt to be able to move into. Uh, a uh, silver medal spot that we thought was pretty much locked, knowing knowing uh, Gonzalez's uh, uh, likelihood of making his 176 attempt. After he hit the 172, I jumped to 182 and just sat there and waited for the comp to unfold, and mm-hmm. then back down into 181 after uh, Arroyo made his 180 second attempt. So 181 would have temp- temporarily given us gold and put him mm-hmm. in a great position to post a massive total. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't think that, that was gambling uh, the gold medal in total away because we still had a, a, a better clean and jerk than all of the competitors uh, that had a shot. Is that a fair breakdown? Yeah, that was great. <laughs> um, that was fully comprehensive. Yeah. Now, Wes, what was going through your head as you were walking up to that 181? I mean, do you prepare for this mentally beforehand through the training? Yes, we had, you know, we've been thinking about it all through the past, really the last six weeks leading up to it. Like you said, the numbers are pretty much cemented into training and in my mind. And that's what I'm seeing when I when I look at the meet, when I visualize. So, you know, I'm expecting... I, I just figured it was 180. I didn't look at it. I didn't mm-hmm. think about it. And honestly, if he had called 78, 77, it wouldn't have surprised me. But it just, like, when I'm in the back room, uh, Dave knows he's got the reins. So I'm just preparing myself to make the next lift while he's figuring out, you know, where I need to be and what I need to make to succeed. And he put me in a position to be successful. So that's, you know, ultimately the the best he could have done give me a gold medal so you know, i'm so happy with that it seems like from what i've always seen from you and from i mean you did a little like written interview interview with me i don't know seven eight months ago now and it seems that you just put a huge amount of your trust in dave i remember i one of the questions i asked was something along the lines of how would you recommend uh, an athlete beginning out to try and beat you someone who wants to be the best how would you tell them to beat you and you said your number one piece of advice is just find a coach that you completely believe in and and go to the gym. And that's basically it. Just have a coach who you can kind of see has been to the top of the mountain or is, has at least been able to bring people or bring athletes up to a certain level that you trust. You know how, you know that they know that they can do it. And, um, you know, I think that's something that I think people put a lot of emphasis maybe on the training solely. And they forget about the teammates and they certainly forget about how important it is to have a coach who actually knows what they're doing and who has who has done it before. Do you find that, I mean, I I could be wrong here, but you seem like such a good athlete that there are probably many programs that you would do great on. But do you think it's it's almost having Dave there as a coach, which is, you know, the kind of thing that's led you to get a little bit over the top of everyone else? Certainly. Um, 
when I when I came out, the first thing that we really worked on was the snatch, and I, I went from probably a guy that made maybe seventy percent of his snatches in training, and you know I I didn't know any better at the time, but like I would be you know just I'd make about seventy percent of my lifts I attempted, which mm. that sounds ridiculous, but anyways I came out to Cal Strength, and just a few weeks later, you know we're entering some some new stuff, and and I didn't miss a snatch for for months and this mm-hmm. is this is immediately like as soon as i've i've just got somebody looking at at what i'm doing talking me through it and you know of course the program he gives me gives me an opportunity to be successful and do all that we're not taking silly attempts or anything but um you know it just uh that certainly jump started my trust and and what we do out here um but yeah if you if you can find somebody that that you know is going to steer you right and that it isn't, um, you know, that's not in it necessarily for themselves or, the, you know, you can tell they're not distracted. They really just want success for their athletes. I mean, you can just offload everything to that person and they can keep you on a program that will keep you healthy and keep you like, maturing in the sport and they mm-hmm. can, can help you through a meet. They can count. They, you know, you just find somebody like that and uh, quit thinking, just attack attack what they give you to do and you know of course you can you can have a dialogue and and be like go through the journey together um but uh yeah it's just it's so important to have to have a coach and and if you can get a a little team too behind you a little uh training environment i mean that's Mm -hmm. huge as well so that's my teammates do a great job of uh you know coming around me and you know i'm not on there not on their exact cycle and we don't you know, compete at the exact same time, but mm-hmm. these show up and they know when I have to go heavy and they try to provide a, a good environment as well. So um, big, big shout out to the, the guys on the team too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And this seems to be a program that has produced champions, you know, not only with young, great athletes, but also with older lifters and very, very young lifters. So Dave, I'm kind of curious to see how you develop this uh, training philosophy. I know you use a lot of like block periodization, and uh, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in hearing how you deviated away from the earlier days of Cal Strength to develop this uh, current protocol that you have. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that you know, as a coach, you know, if you're if you're interested in being a coach in weightlifting, you have three things to be concerned with, um, and that is your intent. Uh, your competence, and then ultimately your experience, and it, it has to it has to fall in those it, those 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 things at that at that um, at that prioritization. So you know your intentions for your athletes. That's 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 number one. Um, and so you know, Cal Strength is littered with a lot of bad ideas. You know, our history is has has started from you know. My journey as a weightlifter going full into the Bulgarian system, bringing over Abhijiev, bringing over Nikolai Kristov, bringing over Martin Pashov, renting a house, setting up a, a, a training hall in a garage, and really kind of just putting ourselves in the wood chipper, so to speak, you know, in the throes of the Bulgarian system. And we were we were very uh, adamant, at least I was very adamant, that we I didn't want Bulgarian light. I wanted whatever Abhijiev thought was going to build the best lifters. I wanted mm-hmm. that experience and I wanted it uh, um, to, to, to kind of see where, where we could take it. And, uh, you know, recruiting the American athletes, uh, Donnie Shankle and Max Ada and um, uh, ultimately James Moser, you know, those guys bring those, those guys into the fold. Um, you know, none of us were successful, um, at the end of the day. And the Bulgarian experience was, was the, the start of kind of a problem solving, uh, journey that, that we went down. And so from there, I mean, very people, very, very few people know, you know, after the nonprofit American weightlifting was, was, was dissolved and we opened Cal strength, the for-profit, uh, we had everyone from Yasha Fay to Glenn Pendele, you know, come and, and work as, as, as coaches at Cal strength while I was trying to build the business around the weightlifting team. Um, mm. and so, you know, the Cal strength, uh, program as it sits today is basically 
a, a byproduct of all of those collective experiences that that I had, um, and then you know using those experiences through the lens of of of, of um, you know what we did with Abujiev and what we did with Glenn to come up with a program that works for Americans, um, a program that is suitable for our culture, for our for our value systems, for our abilities to train for the athletes that we we have here. Um, so you know it's 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 great to envy or 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 be appreciative of what's going on overseas, whether it be China or whether it be Russia. But ultimately, you know, I've I've kind of over the last five years really put my head down and figured out, you know, what can we do here to be successful? What 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 types of athletes do we need? What type of of exercise selection is required? What type of what type of properties do we need to develop? Um, uh, how do we organize the training from from a from a modified block periodization standpoint and 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 how do we motivate people properly? And so tying all that together is what makes the Cal Strength program successful today. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things which I've always found kind of interesting, you, people talk all the time about wanting to do the Bulgarian program. And um, and they put forward a good fight. And I, I definitely think that it has it can work very, very well for a lot of people. It might not be the best way to do it, but people act as though it is 100% the right way to train. And I think people forget, and I heard you mention this just once, Dave, was that you guys tried it with the Bulgarian coach and Bulgarian athletes as good. You replicated it as well as you could have without having moved to Bulgaria. And the fact is, it didn't work. And people are so obsessed with the idea that it does work. And I just find it interesting that, you know, People maybe think that this is like the holy program, but you guys tried it. It it was great. You guys did make improvements. You know, James Moser was absolutely phenomenal, but it didn't do what it did to the athletes in Bulgaria. There was clearly a missing component. And that actually what you do now and you use more variety and you use a lower average intensity and all these different ways of building up these different components of physical training, that has worked far better for the clean athlete in the USA than a 100% intensity high specificity program ever has done well i mean i think that uh you have to be careful with that it's just it's a slippery slope because ultimately if we look at the bulgarian system and what the bulgarians did you know there has never been stronger more capable weightlifting athletes ever produced in the Mm -hmm. history of the sport than you know from the late 70s to the late 80s in sure. in 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 Bulgaria. You know, mm-hmm. you can, you can rattle off the list of, of names just as easily as I can, but there are mm-hmm. there 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 is uh, undeniable empirical evidence that the Bulgarian system produces the the best results in the sport. Now, uh, you know, it's worth that, mentioning that it does produce the best athletes in the sport in Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, well, in the yeah. history of the sport, really, right? Mm-hmm. I mean. Uh, if, yeah, if, I suppose. Yeah, uh, and we'll, many countries have replicated it. Yeah, yeah. And what we have, to, what we have to just kind of temper that information with is that uh, there was a large infrastructure set up to be successful uh, from you know the sports schools all the way up to the national team. So you know, while we talk about the Bulgarian system, you know, the athletes that ultimately made it to the national team were very, very much Soviet trained. Uh, you know, different clubs have different philosophies, and there was plenty of volume and exercise selection uh, assigned to their programs when they were younger athletes. Once they got to the national team, it got hyper specific, and the motivation structure is such. In you know, communist area Bulgaria, you had uh, some of the most repressive, brutal form of communism anywhere, and so you had you know these two. Uh, motivation structure uh, tenants that really produced massive, massive uh, incentive. So you had the opportunity to see the West, to have you know more more liberty, uh, to you know maybe own a car, maybe live in Sofia, uh, versus you know the downside of not being successful, going back to your village, you know, going going back to sleep in Bulgaria, and you know doing the same job that your parents, you know, probably did and, and, and basically living a life without any fulfillment or opportunity. Mm-hmm. And so, 
in the context of the human experience, that's the worst thing you can deprive somebody of. And so you have this massive incentive to kill yourself to be successful in the sport with a man that was utterly brutal in his his tactics and his and and his empathy. Right? He had zero empathy. He had zero uh, uh, regard for the the ultimate well being of the athlete. You know, um, in terms of their health, I think he did. He did bond with his athletes. He really was drawn to success. He was really drawn to giving athletes this, you know, uh, this 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 opportunity of of, of achieving immortality. Because um, uh, you know, for anybody who spent any time with Abhijit, you know, he was he was he's a very charismatic, goofy little guy. But he had he he had a lot of depth. <laughs> mm, sure. So um, trying to unravel him today is still. You know, I, f- I find myself talking around, around, and around him. So, what threads of those experiences are still alive in the program today? Because you said modified block periodization, so I'm guessing you've had to take all that you've learned and use that to develop a unique method. Yeah, I mean, so what exists, what survived, is expectation management. So, like you guys have said, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not happy with a participation ribbon. And Wes is not happy with the participation ribbon. We are we are in this thing to compete against the very best. And um, you know, I have I have unrealistic expectations at time, but that's you know that's what fuels ultimately these performances that that are really beneficial. Yeah, and so um, you know, I believe with all my heart that Wes Wes can accomplish whatever he wants to in the sport. Um, and I'm going to help him get there. So expectations is a big part of what survived. Um, the, uh, the, the the second thing that we really picked up on or that I really picked up on living the Bulgarian system was that athletes kind of understood the model that, that was being applied to them. And so they ultimately changed the model in how they a- approach training. So the idea that you could krushka a workout, which literally <laughs> directly translates – into kind of a sandbag scenario. So you're sandbagging a workout so that you can you can survive the next four, five, six weeks of training, right? You're not giving him your true 1RM, uh, your absolute maximum capability. Uh, you're, you're showing him, you know, your 80, 85%, uh, and you're struggling to, to, to make that look uh, correct. You know, and so so as long as you could then utilize his linear progression strategies and tack on five more kilos next week from that whatever lift you showed to be your maximum, that was ultimately you know what kept him happy and kept you on the national team. And so the idea that you could crush the and start at some de minimis point and then work your way up, you know, not letting the competition get too far, not 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 putting yourself in 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 the in, in jeopardy of being injured. There was a strategy that the Bulgarians used to go about their training. <clears throat> so it Wes, wasn't hey, uh, that's for sure. So Wes, mm-hmm. we're kind of talking about expectations. What drove you to Cal Strength, and how has your mindset kind of changed as you've started working with Dave and up into this point, and then leading to the 2020 Tokyo Games? Um, honestly, uh, at the time, I didn't really know. I didn't know what I could do. I didn't really have expectations. I, you know, I was just uh, qualifying for national meets and thinking that was kind of, you know, that was as, as good as it was going to be. You know, maybe I'd win a nationals. I didn't really know until uh, I got on the phone with Dave and he sort of laid out some things and, and kind of told me where I could be at, gave me some expectations and, and told me what we could accomplish together that, you know, I realized that this could be something pretty serious. And, you know, I knew at the time that I wasn't in a, in a position to be success, like really successful in the sport. Cause it was, it was kind of just me. And, you know, I, I'd worked with uh, some different people, but, you know, no one, um, with a, with a crazy resume, uh, like, you know, nothing like Dave's, you know, um, but, um, anyways, just that from talking to him, coming out, for a weekend visit, I could just tell that if I was going to continue to get better at the rate I was at the time, that I needed someone like that, someone that that could mm-hmm. put 
the best uh, experts in sports physiology, you know, in the country around me, and that could could teach me the best techniques that he's discovered in his ten years <clears throat> in the sport. Uh, and you know, he's got a, a team of people to train with, people I can learn from that can push me, that I can compete with, and um, and just hang out with too. So, it, and that was that was the hardest part about what I was doing before is, you know, I had like a little, I had a little garage gym and I would, you know, work with some people in there and my friends would come out and train with me. But, you know, I was just begging people to come and work out. I, I didn't mm-hmm. really like a, a consistent training partner. I, you know, I had some guys that liked to work out and, you know, they would be there when, when they wanted to be, but, you know, I just wanted to be there all the time and there wasn't guys like that. So, just, uh, mm-hmm. I could just tell from coming out here and, and talking to Dave that if I was going to really do this sport and uh, and spend my time on it, that I needed to be with him to do it. So, and there's a ton of sacrifices that he made to come out here. You know, people don't realize. You know, at the time, Wes and still does. He owned a house that he lived in out there. He had a he had his own gym, uh, Gray School Fitness, that he was working mm-hmm. out of training athletes. Uh, and engaged, and you were in, and he was engaged. He's beautiful. <laughs> now he's married, but he was engaged. So the, there was there there was a, a, a he had a full plate. So for him to you know decide and and the way we are structured it, you came out for three months, right? He he came out under the same auspices that we use to recruit all of our interns. Um, yeah, you know it's a it's a it's a de minimis you know monthly. Uh, you know, it's a couple hundred bucks a month, basically, that you make, and and, and you sacrifice three months of your life. And this is January, February, and March that so we run our our pre-draft training, our NFL pre-draft training. Uh, and so that's what he came out for originally was an internship for three months while we got acquainted and figured out whether this was something that we both believed could 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 work. But just mm-hmm. sacrificing three months of your life when you have all that going on to to come out across the country to see if you can be a better weightlifter, you know. Right there, that decision combined with his athletic ability, you know, I knew we were destined for something pretty special. And then as our relationship continued to grow and our rapport continued to develop, that's, you know, that's kind of what solidified the, the, the decision to, to, to figure out whatever we could do to make him come out full time mm-hmm. and join the, join the squad. Yeah, it definitely shows a lot of commitment to be able to, um, to put, put, becoming an exceptional weightlifter ahead of all those things that you've already got going down for you. I mean, just the fact that you have a house, you've got to mortgage the house, sell the house, go through all these different things, all these things that kind of root you to one place and you uprooted everything just to get to Cal Strength. It does say a lot about the fact that you you wanted to achieve something for you know a long time, basically. Yeah. Well, it says yeah. something about, uh, the again, the human experience, like understanding the idea that those things are not what's going to provide – fulfillment on the on the satisfaction on the way that, that that he can experience you know the the world i mean he is he has an opportunity to be something truly special and he sees that you know for sure now if not then you know mm-hmm. an indication of it but being able to to say you know okay what do i really need to prioritize in my life you know we're not here that long yeah you got yeah. You got you got you got eighty eighty some odd years to figure out how to lead your best life, and so making a decision like this, I think more people need to start reevaluating, you know, exactly what what to prioritize because mm-hmm. this was one hundred percent the right decision, you know, um, and um, you know I think it's just it's something that that people need to to investigate and and take more risks um, to make sure that they're successful so do you yeah, sure. have a high turnover rate at cal strength do you see people kind of come and go because maybe life happens to get in the way or do most people stick and develop in the cal strength system i think we have probably a an above average uh stick rate i mean guys like you yeah. know everybody that we've ever had whether it's you know going back to the to the early days of, of John North and Spencer and and uh, and you know you know moving forward into like you know, Rob Blackwell and 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 Nicole Lim and you know there there there's guys and girls that you know they stick with it for 5 6 years very very 
very often. And we try and make the environment here conducive for them to do that. Um, you know, I'm, 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 this is not, this is not Dave Spitz strength. This is Cal strength. Right. And so we have a, we have a tradition of prioritizing our athletes in terms of how we promote. So, you know, every one of these guys has a following that we've helped them develop, um, and help them build a brand. And so I think that's a big part of it is managing opportunity cost. But, um, you know, when somebody does leave, you know, we, it, it, it kind of shocks us and, and rocks us a little bit, but, uh -huh. uh, you know, you got to stay in the sport if you're going to, if you're going to be successful. I mean, you can't, you can't just train in your garage for a couple months and expect to do anything meaningful. You know, this is, this is, you know, committing to a quad or two quads and having a long-term approach to, to your development, um, and being realistic about, you know, what's possible for yourself. Um, and, and having a coach that's also realistic mm -hmm. about what's possible. I mean, there are several athletes, you know, I've just pulled aside and said, you know, I know what you want to accomplish. And quite frankly, it's not going to happen either. You don't have the physical tools or you don't have the rage to master. That's mm -hmm. going to produce the results you're looking for. So stop wasting your time and mind. Wow. That's a tough conversation to have with athletes, but no, pretty easy. <laughs> really? <laughs> I've had it a couple of times. I mean, it's, 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 it's like putting down a, a, a dog that can no longer walk, you know, it's, it it's quick. <laughs> easy thing to do. Are you, are you going to give us any information on who some of these people are? Or is that, that's Cal Strength's top secret no, stuff? That's, that, that is, uh, <laughs> that's, that's completely confidential, but there, yeah. Wes can, Wes can, well, Wes can, Wes can, uh, can confirm that those conversations do indeed happen here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm, I'm interested. I remember a while ago, Wes, you said that, I mean, I asked you basically if, you, if you're going to win the Olympics, because that's a goal that every, every weightlifter has, and it's certainly one that is, seems more and more possible for you than, than it does many weightlifters. Um, I asked what kind of strength levels you need to get to, and you said – you thought back squat probably has to be between 320 and 340 and front squat between 265 and 275. I'm imagining that Dave, you came up with those numbers. Um, and I'd kind of like to know why those numbers is that you've just seen from data of other great weightlifters. That's kind of where you need to be if you're going to clean and jerk 240 and snatch close to 200. Or is that specific to Wes? Or, you know, where, where do these kind of strength numbers come from, these goals to hit? Yeah, I mean, I think from a, a structural balance standpoint, you know, we have we have baseline ratios that we want the athletes to fall within. But then, you know, for Wes specifically, you know, looking at his lever systems, looking at his uh, ability to uh, to to accelerate the barbell out of the power position, you know, his rate of force production is is off the charts. I mean, anybody right. that's seen him move in re in person uh, will will testify to this that it's. Sometimes he's out of position, but still he can just apply all of this energy into the barbell that just creates this propulsion that's just it's 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 wild to see in person. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, some of those some of those numbers are, are specific to Wes. But, you know, we we start with structural balance ratios that I think are, are, are reasonable. And, you know, I'm. I'm a thrower, so you know I still read a lot of Bonder Chuck, and you know still subscribe to the idea that you know we only need so much prerequisite strength. You know we don't need mountains and mountains of reserve strength to be successful. Mm -hmm. We need we need enough to be able to hold positions and to be able to, to suppress his endocrine system sufficiently to be able to taper him correctly and and produce a, a super compensation during uh, during his taper uh, that's going to produce results and. Uh, I think that he's probably spot on with those numbers. They, they might change a little as the as the uh, weight classes are unveiled. Um, mm -hmm. But because uh, I don't know if he's going to be a 104 kilo lifter or 111 kilo lifter, you know. But you know, we'll kind of make those those calls as 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 we as we go. And for the record, I mean, he's already squatted 290 uh, yeah. and he pulled uh, 305 right on a deadlift. 301. 301. Uh, he said, you, know, you attempted 305 and close. Uh, so three, step that up. 90, like, you know, so, so these strength properties, you know, if we dropped everything on the snatch and clean and jerk and, and just focused on pushing his maximal strength within a matter of months, we could easily hit those numbers. 
those numbers are representative of, of strength levels that need to exist in the context of training. So rising tide, raising all boats uh, type thing, you know, we need to make sure that we all understand it's always better to squat more, always better to deadlift more uh, while we're in the, in, in the throes of continuing to improve mm. technically in the snatch, technically in the clean and jerk, um, you know, because there's the aspects of tempo, timing, tension, um, that, that have to exist. So Wes, what has been the game changer for mm. your technique? Do you think it's been kind of verbal cues, uh, positional drills, exercises, uh, what's really made it click for you? Um, yeah, it's a, a combination of all order. <laughs> yeah. Like honestly, uh, cause right off the bat, basically he threw me in a, a Tarakti boot camp, which is super hands-on. And well, actually the first thing we did was probably like an hour of empty bar work or well work shoot while Dave just sat there and stared at me and made sure everything was perfect so uh, from like moving me around just sitting there just telling me no do it again or just like I, I don't think I did one empty bar snatch right in this hour probably at least not one that he liked um so that was that was the very first day the first like two hours at the gym was get shown around, warm up, and then Dave tells me how bad I snatched for an hour. <laughs> so, <laughs> ever, that's my first day. Um, Welcome after, to Cal Strengths. <laughs> exactly. Then after that, I, I got to hang out with uh, Alexi Trakti for the weekend, so that was fun. And, you know, I, there was plenty of uh, takeaways there, but then when I came back, it was just all hands on deck for, for snatch because that was the – it was the farthest off from where it needed to be, so we agreed to like uh, to try to make it. We're, we're trying to qualify for the Olympics during during all this, but we're trying to learn how to snatch, qualify for the Olympics, and have a reasonable clean and jerk. And uh, on top of that, we're going to four or five meets in yeah. 2016. Yeah, so, 16 I mean, was, is always a world. The yeah, Olympic year is always a whirlwind, especially for those guys that are you know you know, fringe type athletes that mm -hmm. actually have a, a, a very long shot chance, but still it's worth going for. Yeah. Um, so I think you went to, you went to uh, we did junior Philly. nationals in Philadelphia. Then we went to Kazan, Russia for the Russian Grand Prix. Then mm -hmm. we went to the Olympic trials and then mm -hmm. we went to the Pan Am championships. So yeah. four, four big competitions all back to back to back About to back. Six months. Yeah. In a six month window. Um, and Rob went. Rob went to that Kazan Russian competition as well, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. and Jason. Yeah, Scott. yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Other as well. Yeah, so much fun. That was a, that was a, that was a great time. I mean, that was like uh, USA weightlifting saying, "All right, uh, everybody is exhausted. Dave, just your team leader, your head coach, <laughs> take these athletes, have fun with the Russian Presidents Cup." And they wired me like I don't even remember fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars into my account. <laughs> and then I had to withdraw in cash, take over to Kazan, Russia, trans, tr tr transfer that into rubles, rubles. and then pay everything <laughs> in cash uh, with this ragtag group of Americans. And <laughs> we had the best time in Kazan, just hanging out, bonding as a group. John Bros was there. So it was Angela Bianco, Jason Starks, Rob Blackwell, Donovan Ford, West Kitts, Ethan Herrick um, on the men's side. And we... We ultimately, uh, you know, it is a very professional meet. The Russian President's Cup, like, they do a nice job. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, is, it is very well organized, and, and they, they, they make sure that you have, you have an incredible experience. But closing ceremonies, you know, in typical Russian fashion, there's every type of Tartar Stan folk dance that, that comes out. There's, you know, ball gowns, and there's tuxedos for the people that are their master of ceremonies. And... You know, there's all sorts of vodka being consumed. And at the end of this thing, they totaled up the points. And the United States had somehow won the Russian President's Cup. Crazy. So go over and win Putin's competition was like, <laughs> I've never seen a party die faster than <laughs> oh, yeah. those points. It was like. I bet you guys had to get the hell out of there pretty oh, quick man. after that yes. came out. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a quick It was a good game. competition. I mean, the year before. Yeah, year before gave birth to one of the best clean and jerks ever. So it's it's always been a pretty fun, pretty fun competition to watch. Oh man, it was it was a blast. But anyway, yeah. yeah. So what you I mean you mentioned Wes's 
body weight and the weight class is changing. I know you never got a chance to to try and get that 221 from Wes Barnett, which is a shame. I don't think, I could be wrong. I don't think there's going to be another opportunity. I mean, there might be. Um, no. Yeah. But what kind of weight class do you think you're, are you hoping for? I'm assuming something like 108, 110, something around there. Um, I I can make 105 really, really easy. Honestly, I have to, I have to be careful not to be too light during a lot of our training. And even mm-hmm. like our cut, somehow the, the weight just slides off. I don't really, you know, I don't have to harp on how much I eat too much. If I just like, cut out the silly stuff, then I can make weight really easy. So honestly, I don't want to go up too much. I could, I would, you know, a kilo or two would be really, really comfortable for me. And then uh-huh. I'd like to see what I can uh, squat and pull and stuff in training, being just that little bit heavier. Just I think that's uh, just kind of the athlete in me, just want to see what I can do when I'm a little heavier. But I wouldn't mind being – even just a little bit lighter too, because it's like I said, it's not hard for me to be a 105 by any means. I don't have to sauna or like I barely water cut. I eat pretty much every meal. So like, yeah, that's the funny thing about Wes. Everybody assumes that he trains so heavy, and it's just mm-hmm. like it, that is a total misconception. I mean, there are I've times- had people say that you've 113 before, and I thought that's that can't be right. <laughs> He's ne- we've never seen close to 113 on a scale. I mean, he's and, and we're. I'm a stickler for this, and he can he can attest to this. Like mm-hmm. as a 105 kilo lifter, he's allowed to gain five percent over during mm-hmm. our strength work, or during our accumulation phase. You know, where we're really tacking on volume and really kind of, you know, being prophylactic and making sure that his knees and shoulders and hips everything feel good. He's allowed to to to, to generate five percent over his his competition body weight, which is 110 mm-hmm. kilos. Yeah. He can be 110. I'm fine with that. And the second we move into our transmutation phase, he is on uh, a slow burn down to 2% over. So by the time we get to the realization phase, he's got a full phase mm-hmm. of training where he's, he's, he's right at 107 kilos. Yeah. And two kilo water cut is no problem for him. Um, and without that, we really, you know, are going to sacrifice balance points and 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 things in the jerk that are going to make it very difficult to succeed in competition. So I've always been a stickler for that. Um, so I would like to see somewhere around 106, 107 would be a great body weight category mm-hmm. for him. Um, and then, you know, if we have, you know, 120 kilo class or 111 kilo class for Donovan, that would be awesome. Yeah. Um, kind of just let people marinate into into these spots. So how yeah. long do you think it would take for someone to reach their potential in a weight class if they move up another four or five kilos? Are we talking like six months, a year? What's the time? Uh, that's, it's, a, it's a good question. It's really dependent mm-hmm. upon what the athlete's capabilities are, you know, because I think that, uh, you know, if, 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 if strength is a weakness, so to speak, you know, if you're a very efficient weightlifter, um, then moving up you know, you're going to, you're going to be able to transition some of that additional accumulated strength, um, probably in five to six months, something like that. If you are, uh, if you're, uh, an athlete that is very strong in relation to your lifts, you know, moving up a body weight of three or four kilos is probably not going to do much to improve your snatch, clean and jerk, mm-hmm. uh, it might help stability. So if you have a the only, the only caveat to that, if you have like a lanky athlete, you know, that, that is having real trouble stabilizing weight overhead, you mm-hmm. can you help stabilize those levers um, with additional body weight. But, you know, it's everybody wants these uh, these 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 neat rules to exist uh, for weightlifters. And, you know, it is a sport that requires a lot of of individual consideration. It's easy to yeah. get up to the weight too, but like your your body fat content is still going to be high relative to where you were. So I feel like to put the weight on is one thing, and you can Good make point. some some progress like that. But to truly fill out that weight class the the way you were in your past, I mean, honestly, to to make that much muscle, it takes a, a yeah, long time. You're right. You're right. That's a good point. I mean, even less like. You know, looking at him as a 105 at 
Pan Am's 2018 versus 2016, you can see the difference. There's probably, you know, a 2% uh, lean body mass difference between those two athletes, you know, uh, and he's, he's continuing to tack on more and more quality muscle uh, as we, as we continue to train. And so, you know, every time he cuts, he's, he's a little leaner, he's, he's got a little more muscle. And so that's probably what's making the cut easier too. just you being a furnace. <laughs> So how much is a plan subject to change? Say, like, I don't know how far you guys plan ahead if you're already planning up the entire quad or, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what's your approach to planning, like, a long stretch of training? Yeah, so I, ha- I do have, like, a macro quad plan that, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to feel the, 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 what properties we really want to bring out in, in given years based upon where the athlete needs to go. But then every year is built out one week at a time, uh, starting in, you know, December of, of the prior year. So 18 was built out in December of 2017. So every single week of Wes's life is accounted for. And so the worst thing I can see on the IWF calendar is a TBD for, for a competition. It's like, gets me, gets me freaking crazy. Cause I want to be able to plan, uh, Typically, what he'll do in a, in, a, in a calendar year is two training blocks. So we'll have two primary anchor dates that we're, that we're working towards. And so, like for Pan Ams, he had a 16-week uh, opportunity to put his head down and train. Before Worlds, we have 20 weeks. Um, and so knowing all that and then you know, understanding what phases are going to exist in those training blocks and then what mesocycles are going to exist within those phases, you know, those are all built out long ahead of time. And then I can change mesocycles, you know, slightly within the context of, you know, what's going on with, 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 with Wes or with, with Donovan, with, with any of our athletes. But, uh, you know, the, the recipe is already written and it's just, uh, you know, subtle tweaks here and there that we need to account for. So Wes, how do you feel looking at this entire plan, knowing that you're basically your life for the next few years is already pre-written? Um, it's calming. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to, like I said, I, I don't have to worry too much about about anything, um, you know. And we we've talked enough times by now. We, you know, we know exactly what the other wants. For we, I mean, obviously it's the same thing, but um. I mean, it's just, it's, it's easy and we've, we've talked enough and we, we know what we want to do and we just make the workout. We hit it as hard as we can. And, uh, and I've not had a, you know, I've not come off a, a cycle disappointed and it, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's nice. It's easy. So I, I can imagine if, uh, if I was a little nervous about who was handling me, that it would be less, uh, calming but like i said like just knowing that you know i'm going to be in cal strength i'm going to follow four to six week cycles and i can almost predict exactly what kind of stuff we're going to do like it it's just uh it's it's easy he is he is very uh he is very good at holding me accountable for making sure that he has exactly what he needs you know i will i will i will hear about it if he doesn't have everything that he needs um and uh, and that's that's a great way to go when you have an athlete that's pushing you, you know, to be better. That's I think that's what every coach needs ultimately. You know, if you have never had a, a, an athlete that really drives you to be your best version of of yourself, then you're missing out as a coach. And it's it's uh, it's unique when you get an athlete that has the rage to master like what Wes has. Right? It's one of those things where. Uh, I would say that as talented as he, as he is physically, most of his talent resides between his ears. And it's not just, you know, competition. It's every single day being able to be accountable for putting in deliberate practice where he wants to get better on a daily basis. And if he doesn't feel like he's getting better, then he's going to want to want to figure out, you know, exactly what has to be changed to, to put him back on path. And coming up with an annual plan, 
you know, gives me an opportunity to outline expectations for him. So here's how you should be, uh, here's how you, here's how you should expect to feel. And here's the results that we expect out of this cycle. Here's the things that might take a small hit. Here's the things that we want to improve from a, from, from a, from a quality standpoint. And so him knowing what I expect and what he should expect of himself helps govern and, and keep honest every single practice in a way that, you know, showing up and just getting a workout handed to you day of just never could. I like the way I think I've heard you describe it before is that you're kind of, you're creating a, a training program and then an environment essentially to set the stage for a big performance. Um, it seems kind of different to how many people approach it, but it's, and it, it seems to work. I mean, I watch all the Cal strength videos and I have done for years and it's, you kind of know what's going to happen in the next few weeks because you can see it being built and you're very open about what's being focused on for the next few weeks. And it's kind of fun for people to watch and they know that this stage is being set where we're going to see, you know, the, the 220 uh, clean or the 221 clean or the 221 clean and jerk or the 237 behind the neck jerk. Like all these things we know that they're coming. And I'm, I'm kind of... I, I, this wasn't the reason why I was going to ask this question, but now I'm kind of interested. Where's do you find the fact that you have people watching you on the YouTube channel? Does that add to it, or is it just so all in your own head? You really, you're really not bothered by that. Um, the the YouTube doesn't get me as much as the. Uh, I mean, I don't. Know, I guess it's more like my my personal my Instagram, honestly, because like you see the same things every week. And like as soon as I do the first movement of a new cycle, like the comments fill up with predictions, and a lot of yeah. them are, are really high compared to maybe what <laughs> we're gonna do. Even. But some of them are spot on. But regardless, you know that there's expectations from not just me, Dave, my teammates, but also you know everyone that that also cares from from outside the gym, from afar. Um, and then you know Dave will bust out the Instagram live too for some sense. yeah that's pretty tense too because like you said everyone knows what's coming and what's expected and it's going on the bar but you know am i gonna fail and everyone's gonna be disappointed right then or will i make it and everybody will be super excited so you know it's it's fun and it definitely adds to it um but uh sometimes i just wish we could uh burn all the phones <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah it's like uh well, we spoke Kelsey about the media outlet <laughs> well, we spoke about this, you know, from a from a standpoint of motivation and, and incentive on the Bulgarian side. You know, I think that some of our motivation uh, on the American side does come from the technology. You know, like it's it's okay to 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 want to be able to showcase what we're doing out here, uh, whether it be uh, on Instagram or on YouTube, and and generate appreciation for how hard these athletes work. And that's one of the things I appreciate about you two is that you guys are you guys are very uh, humble in terms of like understanding what the athlete goes through on a day to day, somehow having empathy uh, in a world where, you know, most, most people who are uh, uh, watching and, and observing and, and, and commenting, you know, cavalierly about the, the, the lift here and there, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it, it does, it does kind of get a little uh, frustrating at times, but you guys are always so positive about your assessment. Because every lift that you watch, everything that you everything that you see on social media is simply a snapshot in time of what the athlete is doing, uh, and so without oh, yeah. context of what did, what did, what did last week's training look like? What did the week before that look like? Yeah. What is what is the athlete you know experiencing in terms of fatigue? Uh, so if if technique is breaking down, is there is there a reason you know without without knowing all those parameters, it's really difficult to. to to levy a judgment. Um, the only thing you guys, you know, that anybody should judge is, okay, so how did, how did you look in competition? What did you look like on stage? Yeah. Do we see improvements? You know, do we see, do we see success being generated? Um, so I've become somewhat of an empiricist in my old age. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems like, and I, I love the fact of, I love how this has happened, but for the first, maybe, I don't know when it was, maybe 2016, People would say this was kind of where's when you were kind of still relatively new on the scene, 
and people would say that you're very strong, but you're not the most consistent lifter. And it seems like in the last year, uh, you've basically shut everyone up. I mean, like your last two real performances, Worlds and then Pan Ams, you've done which have made the forums all go quiet. Like it's kind of undeniable now that you're the top 105 and, you know, one of the top, maybe the top lifter in the USA. Um, and it's it's cool to see how how much that has changed. I know you were saying at the start that um, Dave just focused heavily on your consistency and how you used to make 70% of your snatches. But I do like the way that it's it's not necessarily that you're lifting more, though you are. It's also the fact that you're lifting these heavy weights so consistently. I mean, I think we had maybe a two-month stretch, it seemed, because I do the news show, so I'm talking about it every single week, where you snatched 173 every single week. And like that level of consistency is something that we haven't seen from a 105 in uh, in a long time, at least with those 170 plus kind of weights, 170 plus 210 plus kind of weights. Yeah, no doubt about that. I mean, we we definitely pride ourselves on you know making, especially in those later stages of preparation in the realization phase. You know, we mm-hmm. are dedicated to making successful a- attempts that move the needle, that 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 represent yeah. progress. And so there's only you know, we talk about this a lot. There's only certain lifts in a given cycle that actually get you better, that actually are going to kind of lay down, you know, new, 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 new genetic, you know, information that's going to help you lift bigger weights the next time around. And so from, uh-huh. from, from that standpoint, you know, we really hammer home like, hey, this is, these are the important lifts in this cycle. This is, this is where you have to be locked in and focused. And he always rises to the occasion for whatever reason. Um, because it's not easy you know like there's some there, there's a there's a wide dis- disparity of how he feels lifting that one sure. each one of those you know three four weeks in a row but to mm-hmm. find a way um I and mean, man i thought his 172 was the best competition snatch he's hit mm-hmm. i mean that was it was it, it was, was absurdly easy it was so good i mean and he would have crushed yeah. 176 177 that day you know sure yeah but, yeah, so it's a you know, lot. I do, Josh. I don't want to. Oh, go on, go on. No, go ahead, Seb. I, I just want to ask because Dave, you said this a few times, and because I've mentioned it on the on the podcast a few times, I've had people ask me what it is, and so I want to hear it from you because you know it better than anyone else. Can you explain once and for all what is a dual priority transmutation phase? <laughs> <laughs> You made that up for me, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was something that well, I, I made. thought you might. Have. I <laughs> I've tried to explain it. I don't even know if I got it right. I've done my best on the show before. But... Priority transmutation. The only case. thing that's more important than exercise and intensity selection is the name of your cycle. So <laughs> yeah. after we yeah. get it down, we spend at least ten minutes uh, <laughs> watching Dave write on the whiteboard different names for these. <laughs> <laughs> he's quite proud of the name uh, arguably the reason that barbell wad and uh elite and club programs are so successful is because of the names of the cycles yeah. and whatnot yeah it's awesome i think so. uh, I, we need to step our own names up i think because we, <laughs> we don't have the kind of traction that you guys have over at cal strength um well, so uh, dual priority means that we have two things that we really want to focus on in terms of prior- priorities. So uh, we picked uh, one strength movement and one Olympic variation per four-week mezzo that we really wanted to focus on. So whether it was the, the jerk and the pull or the front squat and the, and the snatch or whether it was back squat and clean, we picked out two things that I really wanted to push PRs in. Uh, each each of the four weeks uh, before our realization phase, and so you know, part of you know working to develop theories of weightlifting and and then put them into practice is being able to know when when they're successful and when they're not. Um, and I think that we we're very good at uh, if your theory doesn't produce the results you're looking for, then you need to throw it out quickly and and retool because it has to. It has to work across scale and, and cohort. And, uh, you know, for West, the, 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 that dual priority transmutation phase worked really well in the snatch, the clean, and the jerk. Um, we missed a couple strength variations, but also by the time we got to the realization phase, there were some movements that were kind of out of practice. So I thought it was a right. reasonable time to kind of work on something new 
you know, being, you know, as far out as we were from having to do anything that really uh, represented uh, uh, a, a factor in our Olympic qualification. Um, but I don't think it worked very well for the for the group at large. So, and we got you might not practice. see that again. <laughs> <laughs> we got some really good, uh, you know, long term experience out of it. Like I think, I think my big behind the neck jerk came out of that. Which I, I mean, the two thirty seven, yeah. right? And then there was probably a big. Did my first two twenty one come out of one of those? Yeah. Maybe two twenty. Two twenty. It was the best two twenty clean you'd made, and so some good things that we can build on came out Your of front it. squat two fifty yeah. front squat came out of it. But yeah. just before a meet, it's kind of close to to let some things get stale. So you know, yeah, it was good. Like, and I think it's good. Like, it's a great long-term training protocol but maybe uh, makes the realization phase a little tougher that last that last four weeks because you really have to start honing your skills yeah i think there's probably room for it but you have to you would have to have at least uh kind of two mesocycles in a realization phase to to make something Mm -hmm. like that work um and so like you know, we're, we're we're still not where we need to be. So building models and then trying to break your model and and sure. and see where it falls apart is part of uh, mm-hmm. is part of the 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 journey. You know, so this 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 gym is is sure. a lab, and while nothing we do passes the rigors of science, you know, we do have empirical data that we can evaluate and and use to kind of go back and retool our process. And so, you know, anybody that accuses us of of using bro science. Um, you know, I would say that we use no science. Uh, there's nothing that happens at Cal Strength that would ever pass the rigors of science. Uh, but we do have data, and we do have uh, we do have a very humble approach to being able to retool quickly. You know, when something doesn't produce results, so you know, something some, some something produces six draft picks and a Pan Am champion uh, in the same year. Yeah, it has to work. <laughs> So for the coaches listening, what what sort of resources would you provide them with? Maybe uh, authors that you've kind of looked up to, read a lot of their work, influenced the way you've programmed and developed your, your model. Um, well, I think that there's huh Mark and Kelly. And... Well, I I mean from from an authorship standpoint, I think that uh, you know getting getting your head around all the Soviet literature that still exists you know whatever whatever you can do to to access you know medvedev and uh verkashansky and uh roman all those great 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 thinkers back in the day um you know Bondarchuk. um uh i think that you know you, you've got to, you've got to get that going but there's there's no substitute for developing a base understanding of physiology and kinesiology and then using whatever you have in terms of your lab to experiment on on programs that work within the context of your culture that you build and so um you know i i shudder at the idea that there is a a a hard and fast formula for every gym in the country to 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 be able to replicate our success um Mm -hmm. so you know Certainly, get a get a, get a, get a good handle on physiology, kinesiology. Read read everything that the Russians wrote um, that you can get your hands on, and uh, and then be a student of the sport. And don't 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 fall into the trap that you can become uh, a master of this stuff overnight. You know that. Have you ever seen the Dunning Kruger model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Dunning Kruger model. You and if you think you know. If you have, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So it's a you know competence and confidence, and so when you start anything, you know your 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 confidence is sky high because you don't know what you don't know, and so you 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 think you've got shit figured out, and then quickly mm-hmm. as you become competent, your your confidence falls falls precipitously, and uh, so you know as you get better, your confidence starts to rise uh, as you increase in competence slowly, but mm-hmm. uh, you know don't fall into that trap of thinking you know anything because the model that you're using and what you think you know about the sport until it's proven in battle you know it, it's not real yeah it's one, of my, to say, yeah one of my favorite qualities in in a coach and in dave um just having someone that that 
is open, open-minded. So like, you're never going to see Dave just immediately rule something out. He'll at least consider it. Um, and you know, and of course, unless he's had experience with it before, but, um, you know, like we, like you said, we experiment, we, we think through things. There's no just cut and dry one way to do something. And that's exactly how I think. And of course I haven't, you know, I, my expertise are far, uh, below Dave's, but, um, I do, you know, I do some training myself. I work with a football team and, and have done personal training. And, you know, that's kind of my approach is that I, I don't know, you know, everything. And if I've, not tried it i'm certainly not going to shoot something down so just the fact that Mm -hmm. that he takes the same approach to training and and athletic development as i do is just uh, uh, makes it that much easier to to work together yeah great sense and seb i know you you have to run soon so um i think we'll wrap up and i I really want to thank you guys for coming on and just having some uh great discussion with us now as far as plugs go I, I know everyone. Everyone's gonna know where to find you, but if you'd like to throw like the Instagram, YouTube, uh, where they can get a program, something like that. Yeah, I mean CaliforniaStrength.com, the website, and then we have WestKits.com as well uh, that West runs. And uh, you know, I would say that our, our online team is is a lot of fun to to work with. You know, it's not just. Um, it's not just programs, but, you know, it's interaction with the, with us on the feed, you know, being able to, to post, you know, your results and, and, and discuss that with, with me and, and the crew here. Mm. Um, we also have a new offering that is, uh, basically going to be customized. So you can select two anchor dates within your annual plan and use our, our cycles to kind of map out a, a road to success for your your competition and so that i think that's going to appeal to more people internationally that have you know the the mm. portugal national championship may be a distinctly different date than than the uk's and so um i think that that's going to be uh, an exciting offering but you know we try and democratize all this information. So the YouTube, the Instagram, you know, whatever, whatever we can do to be a resource, you know, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of great voices now in the sport. Um, but, uh, uh, I think what we do is pretty, pretty cool. And uh, we encourage people to be a part of it. And, you know, any, 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 any money that goes into Cal strength gets spit out to our athletes too. You know, there's, Mm -hmm. you know, if I make, if I make a buck here, it's, you know, I would say 20 cents of it is going to, to West directly. <laughs> but, uh, no, no, we, we, we definitely have like, I mean, we have a heavy investment in our athletes, whether it's, you know, yeah, uh, whether it's Donovan, West, Jaden, uh, Rob, you know, all, all, all that money, you know, is vital to their success. So if you are trying to decide between program A and program B, you know, uh, uh, I would I would steer you to ours because we are actually putting our money where our mouth is and 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 mm-hmm. giving it back to the athlete. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to say just a big thank you to everything that you guys have done. Uh, just because I mean, I've I've followed Cal Strength for so long. I'm I've been Dave. I've been a fan of yours for a long time just because of what you've been able to do as a coach and also with Cal Strength as a business. I've I've found incredibly inspiring. Wes, again, just yep. for these big lifts, you keep the news show filled every single week because I have something to talk about. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much for, for everything that's you guys our, that's do. Our that's, goal. that's our huge. goal. Seed, seed, seed the internet with uh, with more content. <laughs> Absolutely. Keep, keep, keep weightlifting relevant. That's it. It's you guys the 21st century. Like, yeah, you need to, we, 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 we're, we're, we've been tossing around the idea of having a big Cal Strength homecoming and inviting back all of our old athletes and having a having a big, you know, weekend. It's like an extended weekend of Cal You've got to do it. Yeah. That'd be awesome. That would explode right at the internet. With, uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be too much for everyone to handle. It's got to happen. All right. So weightlifting house sponsored uh, event? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll be there. I'll send some bars your way or something. Something well, to get involved. You got to do You got to be Glenn's handler. That's what you have to do. You have to figure out how to get him dressed and get him on the plane. And get- <laughs> yeah, someone has to. Someone has to handle that man. He's he's <laughs> capable of weightlifting and very little outside of that. So, yeah, someone's got to, Someone's got to cook him food. Hey, he had he 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 has a wonderful mind for the sport, though. I'm, I'm, oh yeah, Glenn 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 left an indelible mark on this place. So. Uh huh. 
<laughs> anyway, we appreciate the time, gentlemen, and uh, we appreciate everything you guys are doing for the sport to 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 continue uh, to keep it um, fresh. And I love the fact that guys like you are are picking up the mantle and running with it because it, it's kind of uh, it was lonely for a long time, and now we have friends. Yeah, well, <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. All right, guys. So, Josh, thanks for having me on again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, guys. All right.